keep it in meeting mode today because we'd like everyone to be able to unmute themselves, raise your hands, um, type in the chat. Uh, this is really supposed to be a participatory discussion. We want to hear from all of you. Um, the meeting is going to be recorded. So if there are any pearls of wisdom that come out and you want to hold on to them or share this with your colleagues, uh, you will be able to do that. Um, we're going to be sharing the recording after the meeting. Um, so with that, I will pass it to Dr. Morgan if you would like to kick us off or introduce yourself. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Robin, for the introduction. Um, I am Dr. Randall Morgan. I presently serve as the president and chief executive officer of the W. Montague Cobb National Medical Association Health Institute. I know that's a, uh, a large title and the job is even larger, but um, it has been a, a joy over the past 17 years to work with the Cobb Institute. And uh, we are also so pleased to partner with uh, NATO on not only this webinar today, but on uh, this particular project that looks at uh, best practices for our health departments uh, across the country. The W. Montague Cobb NMA Health Institute was launched in, uh, by the National Medical Association at Howard University in Washington, DC in 2004. That also happens to be my alma mater for medical school. And I practice as an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, the Cobb Institute was launched to study proposals and solutions for health disparities and health care inequities. And we've had an opportunity to partner with many organizations, including the Office of Minority Health, NIH, CDC, and more recently, NACHO, to address challenges of vaccination in communities of color as well as communities at large historically for adult influenza and now for COVID-19. So we share the interests of NATO in the need to improve the effectiveness of the local and county health departments uh, in the quest for increasing community-wide vaccination rates and then the challenges of planning for the post-pandemic status of these communities. As a result, the Cobb Institute developed a survey for the 10 health departments that were selected by NACHO. The purpose of the survey is to determine the common themes and best practices shown by each of the respective health departments. We received a significant amount of information that will be summarized and shared with all of our partner health departments and certainly with NACHO as we do the completion of this project. Uh, but today we will use some of the resources from those surveys in the questions and answers uh, that are shared um, collectively. Uh, recurring challenges and themes observed in the local communities and health departments included misinformation, mistrust of the government, young adults and their particular issues, limited opportunities to provide education, staff burnout at every level, and uh, the stresses of leadership who much react, must react to a diversity of demands in the public health uh, departments uh, across uh, our country. So, so today we have the honor of having Dr. Virginia Kane to be our discussant uh, and our expert. When we agreed to work with NACHO, it was because we knew that we had a nationally known expert who has been a leader in her health department for many years in Indianapolis, Indiana, and has a perspective that can share many, many best practices. And so the opportunity today 
is to converse with Dr. Kane and to literally pick her brain in terms of her experiences. And then of course, uh, focusing uh, toward the end on the current status uh, of the pandemic, what may come after the pandemic and what all of our local health departments, whether they be county, state, uh, can uh, do to uh, alleviate some of the stresses that we all face. Dr. Kane is a uh, medical school graduate of uh, the State University of New York, as well as uh, she has a, a fellowship in uh, infectious disease at the uh, University of Washington in Seattle. She presently serves as the director for the Marion County Public Health Department in Indianapolis, Indiana. She demonstrates enthusiasm and energy for all clinical aspects of infectious diseases, including but not limited to HIV and its associated opportunistic um, infections involving skin and soft tissue, um, bacteremia, sepsis, uh, and, and the like. But this is only a small part of what Dr. Kane does. She's a very active professor uh, of medicine at Indiana University in Indianapolis, Indiana, but she's also a significant connector among organizations in the community, uh, both on a local level and nationally. And she and I have been involved with National Medical Association activities, and more recently, the research side of, of uh, the National Medical Association. Uh, really for the past 30 years. Um, so I think that there, uh, we could go on with her uh, bio and not have time to hear her thoughts and certainly not have time to, to react to your questions and answers. So right now, I'd, I'd sort of like to welcome Dr. Kane today and uh, thank you so much for joining us. And we're gonna, we're gonna get right to this um, this task that we have before us. So Dr. Kane, it's a pleasure, of course, to welcome you to this webinar today. And we appreciate your willingness to contribute <clears throat> to the discussion. As we begin the conversation, will you please tell me and tell our guests about your community and the demographics that are represented? Well, thank you, Randall. Let me just say, uh, I've been a longtime member of our health department with NACHO for, well, at least over 20 years and, um, and have just really benefited from all the uh, activities and the leadership and the guidance uh, from our uh, organization. So it's just an honor uh, to be here. And, and I'm actually on our board of trustees of our local health department's uh, association here in Indiana. So. Uh, I look forward to this discussion. So let me tell you a little bit about our health department in the city of Indianapolis. There are about 980,000 uh, people in the city of Indianapolis. But if you look at our metropolitan statistical area, including our surrounding counties, and we provide some services in some of these surrounding counties like STD services, HIV services, uh, that comes almost to about 1.8 million individuals. Our demographics, we're about 64% white, 29% uh, Black or African Americans, 0.4% uh, American Indians. Uh, we also pride ourselves on believing that we may have the largest Burmese population in the country with about 4% of our community, the Asian population. And then when you look at our Latino X population, we're running about 15%. Uh, percent. And overall, about 31% of the folks in Indianapolis have a bachelor's degree. When we look at our median household, it's about $48,000. And we're, we're, we're the home of um, Lilly Pharmaceutical Companies, Roach uh, Diagnostics, and for any of you basketball fans out there, uh, the headquarters of NCAA. Um, and so um, 
I'm, I'm looking forward to, to this discussion and further questions, uh, Randall. Thank you. So um, we'll oh, just be with thing, you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. One last thing that might be important. I have about 850 uh, employees, okay. So um, would you um, describe for us exactly what the Marion County Health Department does, what its jurisdiction is, and, and, and what is the health, the, the impact of the Marion County Health Department on the health status in the state of Indiana? Yeah, so you know, we're just like, um, we, we experience almost like everything, any, anything else compared to a lot of places. If you looked at the state of Indiana, uh, we rank number 41st, meaning we're 50th being the worst, 41st overall in terms of health outcome for the state of uh, Indiana. But our local challenges, of course, are um, um, uh, uh, infant, black infant mortality and maternal mortality, big challenges uh, with uh, uh, HIV. Uh, we, we have a, a significant environmental uh, department. So, you know, we give permits for septic systems for houses, or we do a concern for lead poisoning in our children and what's happening in our school environment. So we really have almost a whole spectrum, I believe, uh, for a uh, local health department uh, compared to a lot of places. WIC programs, uh, community nutrition programs, um, community health centers where we provide immunizations uh, for everybody a lot of school uh, health education. So just, just numerous uh, health programs that I believe that are exciting for us that we're involved with. So being a native of Indiana myself, I, I understand the geography very well. And I know that we have uh, particularly looked at communities of mid-size with regard to this exercise that uh, represent both rural populations as well as ur urban populations. And could you maybe describe a little bit more how you serve these different populations? Well, we try to, you know, one of the uniqueness I think about being um, on our board for our uh, Association of Local Health Departments, we have about five large cities in the, in the state of Indiana, but then we have much smaller um, counties, rural areas um, for uh, the state of Indiana. We actually have 92 counties. And so uh, because I'm on our association of local health departments, I get a chance, we meet regularly, um, our state organization uh, on a monthly basis. So I get to know the issues related on those, the smaller uh, counties compared to a, a large uh, county such as myself. And granted, I'm just gonna lay it out to you. I think larger cities, metropolitan uh, health departments, uh, we have advantages, greater advantages, I believe, than health departments in a smaller county. And I say that because right now, one of the big issues that are facing our smaller local uh, health departments is, let's say I don't have enough resources. I don't have enough staff, okay? So if someone uh, has got to go on vacation or, or get sick, I don't always have staff to replace it. So I want to say, oh, there's a grant out here. I can get this money. I'm going to apply for this grant and, and, and that'll be wonderful. Have enough money to hire another nurse. Well, guess what? The way it's set up in a lot of our counties here in Indiana, whatever money you raise, then the city council budget will remove what they're giving you. So it's a zero gain. You know, you're not gaining any additional resources. And so it hampers a lot of our operations, at least locally for us, because if I can write a grant or maybe some foundation wants to give me some money, uh, they look to see what your budget is and they decide what your budget is. And no matter what additional funds you get, uh, they may remove and a lot of them remove the rest of that money. So you're not, you're not having any substantial gains. So um, this is something that uh, even in your coalition of, of health departments, 
not been able to come up with a solution? Uh, well, we're trying to do, so I have to give um, our uh, governor, uh, 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 Hokum, uh, who has set up a commission uh, looking at public health. And we, we have a former uh, chair, Ways and Mean, from our state legislator, Luke Kinley, is a co-chair along with Dr. Judy Monroe. She's a former state health commissioner for Indiana, but she's currently now the, the director of the CDC's uh, foundation. You know, this is CDC's foundation, and this is where Bloomberg gives her money. Bill Gates Foundation gives her money. I think they started off with a substantial amount of funding from Home Depot when they first set it up. So they are a foundation. Uh, even the guy with um, 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 who's a Facebook guy, Zuckerberg, uh, has given them money for their foundation. And so she's our co-chair for this Commission on Public Health, trying to look at these very issues about what should be the standard number of employees we should have. What should be the budget and salaries of these folks? So we may say, hey, I can't keep a nurse because you will not allow me to raise the salaries. And this happens because we have a number of people, they don't have a clue sometimes about what's involved with being a public health nurse, uh, the challenges that we have to face. You know, And a lot of times we're out there on the front lines in the community um, doing this work but yet a hospital nurse can get a tremendous higher salaries compared to what a public health nurse is. And yet, hey, we may be in more danger, okay? Because sometimes we have to knock on people's doors and may go inside and we don't even know what's on the other side of the door. And so, uh, and having to know our neighborhood and looking at the referrals that we may get. And so those are the issues we're hoping that we're going to be able to carve out and have some exciting results related to that. So thank you for that, for that answer. And uh, conversely, uh, many health departments, uh, even though they have all of the best intentions, um, have had difficulty because of the lack of trust in, in the government. Uh, so as you perform your duties as the health department director, how are you able to uh, get around that, that lack of trust or have strategies that can, can uh, mitigate perhaps some of that uh, challenge? Well, I think you definitely have to have strategies and I don't think we're any different than anyone else but we had a huge amount of distrust related to our black and African-American uh, population here uh, in the city of, of Indianapolis. And, um, and I'll start out that some of the major replies we got was, well, what happened with the Tuskegee syphilis incident where you, know, you had 600 black men who had syphilis and the government knowing they had the cure for syphilis, they withheld the medicine. And for at least 30 years. And so you had these men with syphilis uh, because it spread to your partners. And if your partner had any babies, those infections went into the babies. And a lot of these babies had a physical deformities of their face, like a smashed nose, out of nose deformity. Uh, they had brain damage, difficulties, physical difficulties in their legs and their ability to walk. And of course, a lot of these men died because they had neurosyphilis of the brain or they had a big, huge aortic aneurysm that ruptured and they're dying in their 20s. And you know, this, um, this secret went on until the early 1970s is when it broke out. And, and the syphilis went from generation to generation, at least to a fourth generation for sure, because I was on a CDC panel talking about what kind of benefits do we give to the fourth generation of patients from those original clients. So they remember all of that. And of course they're concerned about, wow, this vaccine was developed so rapidly. 
So, you know, I, I, and we're using a new technology. And so uh, that was huge for us and it's still a major problem. So it's no surprise to all of you that when we look at our vaccination rates for COVID, our rates for African-Americans are lower, like at around about a 35% compared to our, our white population, which is probably at a level of about 50% in our highest level of vaccination, believe it or not, is in our Latino X population <coughs> and then followed by our Asian population. But, and um, I hope you're gonna ask me about uh, what did you do to address it? You just did. Well, no, I'm, told, I'm telling you what the, <laughs> what the issues and the challenges are. Yeah, so one sure. of the major things that we have an ability to do is it's a lot, it's about collaboration. So our mayor, uh, Hotset, says we're gonna have to really help uh, our community and our partners uh, and whatever. So we made the commitment of giving $1 million out as many grants to a lot of community not-for-profit organizations that can do their own, get into those own social networks, be trusted messengers, uh, be able to address um, the concerns related to, to folks. And what we found out too was, wow, um, 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 the, the impact uh, from these organizations, I believe was, was incredible in terms of having a trusted message, but we had so much misinformation. Oh my God, it was out there. And I think uh, when we go back and review and reflect on this epidemic, uh, we moved too slow in addressing the misinformation and we moved too slow um, in addressing, and I'm talking about locally uh, from my, my health department, we moved too slow in addressing the misinformation and too slow in terms of the concern about their concerns about this vaccine was developed uh, too rapidly. And we didn't pounce on that to counter that with a lot of information. Now, in my defense is we have funding for communications, but my budget was not such to really have a major social media campaign related to this. And so, and then you got to have people that's got that expertise in terms of knowing what the message is. And that means you got to do a lot of focus groups and hey, what will impact a 60 or a 65 year old person is totally different. How you motivate a 21 year old young adult who never gets sick don't feel the need for getting vaccinated and uh, they, they, they don't wanna be bothered. So different messages based on different age groups and different ethnic groups in terms of their culture, what will push them alone. And with that in mind, could you give us maybe some of your observations or strategies that uh, may have helped to increase the uh, percentage of uh, Latin X um, individuals with regard to their acceptance of vaccination? So let me, I'm, I'm just gonna start out by telling you that, uh, you know, um, um, you know I, I guess my greatest mishap <clears throat> in terms of what happened with this epidemic was when I got a letter um, from 20 Latino X organizations, basically, and I'm here, I'm patting myself on the back saying I'm doing a good job. And this is before we gave those many grants out, um, saying that, hey, I'm doing a lousy job on communication. And I'm saying, what are you talking about? You know, in terms of people knowing where to go for testing or where to go for vaccinations. I said, listen, I've got third grade level information that's on my website. And for where you to go get tested 
and get vaccinations. And they say, yeah, that's your problem. That we had such an influx of undocumented immigrants that do not read at all. So no matter what kind of literature you got on that, on your sites, they can't read it. So they don't know where to go get tested, how to register. They don't know um, uh, where to go for vaccinations. And I said, oh my goodness. Uh, so we developed a special lab program where we had what we call our, our mini marathons, where we would set up and ask for volunteers from our corporate sector of Spanish speaking folks to say, guys, we got to sign up our Latino communities here. So we take a Saturday all day from 8 to 9 p.m. at night to say, hey, call on our telethon, telephone telethon, and we will register you, okay? You may be from Colombia, Venezuela. You can speak maybe different kind of Spanish dialects, but we would register over 1,000 people uh, in those telethons and then make sure that we were having our testing, our vaccinations in the sites where they live, where they reside, so they could go to a familiar place and they wouldn't have to be looking up some address and say, now, where is this? How do I reach that location? And then also uh, partnering with critical partners, like a Mexican consulate. Uh, but we said, hey, uh, you need to help us and we immediately changed our system. And, but that's because we finally listened. We listened, that's a key. And they know we were listening and we say, help us design this program in the way that you think is going to make a impact. And we'll be there with our mobile vaccination van if that's what we need in order to vaccinate in your area. So, um, so, uh, it was a lesson learned, but, and then we said, we need to get resources out to you. They, they said, hey, we can help, but we don't have no resources. So we said, hey, we're going to do it. Now, I had some great partners called Results Saving Lives. I don't know if people know the former Tom Frieden, uh, the former director of CDC, who has a company uh, who provided $300,000 to be part of that $1 million or so to help us get these little mini grants out. So that I think was, is huge. Are there any other strategies that you have at this time or are working toward to increase the resources that you need? Well, I think, let me just say, uh, my big challenge is right now I'm down 14 nurses. 14 nurses, that's huge for me. And I'm trying to figure out how, how can I do regular uh, catch up immunizations for my children, uh, and yet I'm down 14 nurses. And of course I'm down 14 nurses because those hospital systems are paying them way more money than what I can pay them. And so I've been uh, trying to use companies that will provide nurses to us. I'm on my fourth company trying to provide nurses, but guess what? As we're utilizing them, uh, then they get, I don't want to say get bought out, bought off, but they find that they can get a much higher salary and make maybe more in six months than that they can make work of me for uh, a full year. So I think we have to look at uh, one, one of the things we're looking at is, hey, I may have to raise my salary. Well, it's not maybe, I know I need to raise my salaries and I hope none of my nurses are, are watching this program, but I know I'm going to have to raise my nurses' salaries, okay? They haven't been raised in over 10 years, all right? But I, I've got to look at this. I've got to have a discussion with my board of trustees to say why this is important to protect um, our community. So it's, it's tough. And you have to ask for volunteers. If you don't have enough staff, then you try to have some healthcare assistance if they're not so overwhelmed and whatever to partner with you are some not-for-profit organizations to help volunteer and help you out. Uh, so maybe I can have someone help register people for me that may not be my employee, someone helping to volunteer uh, for me. So 
help me do some registration. You know, maybe uh, I've been trying to, I've been calling up all my retired folks to say, hey, you got to come back and help us, you know, uh, and they've been coming back uh, and trying to help, not full-time, but they're tremendous using them uh, part-time. But let me just say there are other challenges that I faced. Uh, we had a significant homeless population and we used to average about 1,000 homeless uh, a day before the pandemic and it went to 2,000 homeless. And so when we told the homeless shelters, hey, you cannot hold no more than 250 people in your shelter because if you have an outbreak, that's just gonna explode our hospital systems and our emergency rooms. Well, they said, that's fine. You're making this, this uh, public health order, but then that's your problem. How are you gonna take care of these folks? Because one facility housed 1,200 homeless. And of course, um, there's no way you could do social distancing of six feet, let alone, I couldn't even get two feet. So I unfortunately, had to go into the hotel business, okay? Being able to house them and being able to do the social uh, distancing. So it's a major challenge and a major hunt uh, in terms of any funding I received from that, uh, the CARE uh, Act providing me some uh, funding for COVID. So a lot of times recommendations we make may have some unintended negative consequences uh, for us, but I worked with my school systems. You, I met with them on a regular basis and say, what will work for you in the schools protecting your children? I worked with the business uh, uh, businesses trying to get good advice and listen to say what would work and what would not work. And even your colleges and your undergraduate programs saying, how can I help? You know, maybe uh, I can I can come to you and do the vaccinations if that's possible. But that's not possible if you're a smaller community. You don't have the resources or the staffing to do that. So um, what's the secret? If you can, if I can tell you, think about some, if you've, if you've got any foundations uh, in your city, and, and sometimes people who have stores may have a foundation and you don't know it. Uh, if you can, call and contact them, write a one pager and ask for sponsorships. You know, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 can go a long way for something that's not restrictive. So, you know, you can get some federal funds, but a lot of times it's so restricted. You know, you need resources of funding where you have a need. And I, I can only use this fund based on what the grant says. So see if there's some companies or, or people that provide some services that they can help provide you some resources, even if giveaways that may be a, a benefit. So in the spirit of exchanging ideas and, and sort of having um, transparency, uh, what are some of the things that large city or county organizations, uh, health departments can learn from the smaller um, county and local health departments? Well, I, I, I can just tell you one of the beauties about me from a, a large health department is, is that a lot of smaller health departments, uh, I think they come up with a lot of innovative ideas. Uh, and I, I have no shame, no shame whatsoever borrowing their idea and putting my little logo on it. And uh, I do get permission and I ask, okay? And I will acknowledge them. But we, we have some incredible innovative solutions. For example, uh, one, of our, uh, one of our smaller local health departments developed this uh, to give incentives for pregnant mothers making their prenatal visits or getting their children vaccinated in the way that they should and they can come in for every visit. It's sort of like, they get like a little, it's sort of like food stamps or coupons kind of thing. So, and then you can go into this, what we call our babe shop, where you can get a new crib uh, from these coupons worth a hundred dollars, brand new. 
or you can get diapers, or you can get new clothing items and whatever. And hey, you bring the father of the of your baby to your prenatal visit, you get a double coupon. And so uh, it has worked wonderful. We have partnered with most of our major hospitals and they have set up these, these programs. So uh, it really seems to have provided a great incentive for people to keep their prenatal visits and get them early. And they get rewarded in a sense that, you know, they get the kind of education they need, but they get the early screening and knowledge related to this. And that's one of my most popular programs that I adopted from a small um, uh, a local health department. Now, they may be mad at me because uh, eventually that person decided to move to uh, Indianapolis to uh, initially, um, uh, that was several years after I, I took their ideas though um, uh, for that program. So it's nice to learn uh, what our smaller rural communities are doing because they're just doing some incredible work and in, in the incredible ch uh, challenges. Uh, so, you know, where this phone, phone banks, are they meeting with their faith-based leaders in terms of partnerships? Um, they're, they're meeting with the youth, you know? Uh, a youth knows what will resonate with him, okay? Uh, with this little social media, digital kind of stuff, techie, techie stuff that, you know, I'm not as familiar with, but hey, you ask any teenager, you know, they, they know TikTok, please. Um, they knew all of that stuff. And so, uh, you know, using them to help us as experts uh, makes a tremendous uh, a difference. But I do know you have to have trusted messengers from their own communities that they recognize and that they know, and they already know from a culturally standpoint they immediately know they you understand their culture, and and I think that that's uh, what really uh, helps to make a difference. And so, with that in mind, um, we'll have one last question before we open it up to to our um, participants and team members. What can health departments do to prepare their respective communities? <clears throat> Um, or population centers, depending upon who they represent, uh, for the post-pandemic challenges that we know we're going to face? Well, I think the, the number one thing, I think, and this is sort of like, uh, you need sort of like an after-action kind of assessment of what all your issues were that happened in this pandemic. Because this is going to be your best opportunity. Uh, this will not happen, hopefully, another five or 10 years. So you, this is the best time to make your case for what you need from a local health department standpoint and whoever your board of trustees or whoever makes a difference, this is where you need to articulate your need and be able to just justify it. So the so social determinants for health was really huge that impacted us that we didn't have all those wraparound services we thought that would be available uh, uh, for these clients. So we'd have homeless patients positive for COVID and the hospitals would kick them out, okay? So where do you think that homeless person is going? Who's positive? He's going back to the shelter to infect other people. But no systems were in place to say, hey, you can't go back there, but because it's snowing and it's cold out there, it's freezing out there. Um, I need to have a place for you to go. So we didn't have those kind of wraparound systems. Oh, hey, people lost their jobs or when we shut down, stay in shelter. You know, the hospitality folks, frontline people, you know, they ain't worried about a COVID vaccine. They're worried about when is my electricity going to be turned off? Where am I going to get the money for food? You know, uh, because that first round of funding didn't hit the minority populations, big, big entities like our Harvard's, some of our big companies, 
got hundreds of millions of dollars, but not our minority and vulnerable populations when that first round of money came out. And so we've got to take care of their needs first before they're ready to listen about us taking care of their needs. So it's unfortunate guys, but you need to look and determine whether where your gaps are for the social determinants of health, whether it's housing, uh, your ability to provide transportation for people who need healthcare and access issues. How can you educate somebody and they don't have a primary care provider? Hey, we're gonna do telehealth, well that's fine doing telehealth and your person can't afford the internet, okay? Or they may be a senior person and they're not techie techie to understand how to do telehealth. So look at those gaps, especially that food insecurity, you know, what pantries are available? Where can I go find food kind of thing? So we need to look at the social determinants of health, see where those gaps are and be thinking about it for future planning uh, in the future, but hey, show up your salaries if you can, show up and get some back backup staff as you can, use your state uh, health departments to help educate your uh, county commissioners, your city council folks, uh, your state legislators, uh, that's, that's really important, work on that. Well, oh, those, and you know what, we're getting, right we're, one, one last thing, I hate to say this, we're kind of getting old, some of the folks in public health. So this is our opportunity too, that we need that recruit that young generation in the public health now, figure out how to provide more people uh, to, uh, you know, round with you, uh, learn what public health is about. So outreach to any uh, high school students or outreach to any colleges to talk about, think about public health. We need that younger, young, young generation. Well, I, I certainly would agree with you. And also that uh, as we work on these uh, programs to provide experiences for young high school students, uh, not many of them know anything about a public health or a career in public health. They're more looking at pediatrics or OB or being a heart specialist or something like that. So I think we have work to do to, to uh, show the ad advantages uh, to being uh, in the public health uh, career pathway. So uh, at this point, I would like to ask Robin and, and uh, others, do we have questions? Uh, that we can uh, provide for Dr. Kane. Actually, I do have a question. So while everybody else is thinking about it, maybe getting their thoughts together, um, I loved how you talked about doing that after action report. And I feel like that's such an important next step um, for the local health departments to take. I wanted to ask you about how COVID-19 and the vaccine rollout maybe has changed the way your local health departments um, have been adapting and maybe creating some of those interdepartmental connections or collaborations um, that y'all have taken to kind of increase the flexibility you have when you're doing those wraparound services. So let me just say it's, uh, it was challenging from within. Because, you know, when this COVID epidemic uh, hit, um, you know, a lot of our staff wanted to do their same old, same old thing. So they wanted our clinics, um, you know, eight to five. Um, and, oh, my God, if I had a clinic on a Saturday uh, having a heart attack. And or, oh, if it's at the five o'clock, um, uh, you know, I, I got to get out of here at five o'clock. And so it was tough to say, guys, we've got to meet the community where they are. And so some people work and they're scared if they take time off to bring their kids to work, they're gonna lose their jobs. Some of them are single mothers. And so um, they're scared about that. So we have to have enough, uh, it doesn't have to be every night, but at least one evening clinic to go to 7 p.m 
uh, to accommodate those folks who have those issues. And, you know, you don't have to do every Saturday or maybe, but can you do one Saturday a month uh, to accommodate some folks? So it was, you know, it's a challenge trying to say, um, you know, how do I do this? And then the other challenge we had was, uh, you know, we have a lot of single parent clients and uh, a number start working remotely from home. And so creates, uh, creates, what I want to say, um, animosity sometimes for the people who don't have that luxury of being able to work from home. Got to be on the front lines every day. It's cold. Uh, you know, I have to get this vaccination at our drive through site and whatever. And so it was tough trying to, you know, how do you juggle that? How do you kind of uh, justify that? And so uh, and when people haven't had to have to, had not had to change for a long time, uh, it took a while. But I keep telling people we're twenty four seven. Whether you like it or not, those eight to five Monday through Friday days are over unless you don't have no backup staff or you don't have enough staff because burnout was a problem. Okay, and we had to talk about mental health stress with with our employees and try to find uh, a referral uh, for you to talk about be because of the burnout. And I, and I had employees, I said, hey, I don't care what, do not show your face here. You've been working nonstop. I, I don't care, don't show your face for a whole week. I don't wanna see you, I don't care what you do and whatever, but don't show up for work. Cause we, we just had some amazing, amazing, committed uh, staff that just break, break your heart, how committed uh, they were in, in really trying to make a difference for these folks and just um, some of the hardships that a number of our folks had, you know, people who were disabled, you know, they, they couldn't come out of their, their apartment. They didn't have the ability to, to have someone carry them to a site to be vaccinated. So we had to figure out working with our SACOA organization. This is our agency for the seniors, partnering with them to say, how do we get vaccinations for the folks who are homebound, you know, and make that happen. Uh, but it created a problem because then all the hospitals start giving us referrals to take care of anybody homebound that were of their clients. And I'm saying to myself, mm, you know what? Do you know what a hospital's budget looks like compared to a, a public health department budget? So we said, hey, I can't handle all that, okay? You guys got the money, you know, and, and you're doubling the salary of what you're paying your nurses compared to me. So, uh, but still um, trying to continue to have relationships with those partners that you created, I think is going to be huge. And hopefully someone uh, that's got some resources are, are helping out uh, and will help out for any future initiatives that you that you have. So we've looked at some of the responses from our uh, health departments in terms of what they think are uh, initiatives that have been working well for them in, in their communities. We all know what the barriers are, but in order to keep moving, we have to mix the good with the bad or else we'll all have mental health fatigue. So, uh, so, so, so Rando, I, 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 one of the persons who said, in one of your questions that you put out, what do you feel has been most successful in, in increasing vaccine confidence and uptake in your community thus far? So this person says when Walmart gift cards were being offered, it increased uptake significantly, but our county government would, will not authorize gift card use for vaccines. So, but I thought that that was um, a really a great, question from that department who said why they were successful. I have another one who says, um, grassroots community efforts, including community leaders, was key. Partnerships with the tribal organizations made mm -hmm. a difference. Addressing the social determinants of health along with vaccines and then using mobile vaccination parts 
in high uh, social vulnerability indicators using community health workers they felt was most successful in, in increasing their uh, vaccine uh, confidence. But uh, so I don't know if you have some, I was looking at some others. A lot of them says partnerships with community-based organizations and faith-based organizations and doing a lot of ground uh, outreach in, uh, let's see here. But with that, and looking at that, uh, you, you've spoken a lot about the capacity of the public health department to try to solve the problems based upon resources that the, that the health department has or relationships that, that it has with various levels of government and influential uh, individuals who might make a difference. Uh, what should the health departments be doing to cultivate these relationships with community-based organizations? What, what are those strategies? Uh, and which community-based organizations consistently seem to be more effective? Well, let me just say one thing, and I didn't mention it earlier. Um, a lot of times I had to have technical expertise, you know, my epidemiology work, and I have a significant number of epidemiologists, but uh, when this epidemic is hitting you from all fronts, I got people from the community calling me, I got the schools calling me, I got the businesses calling me. You don't have the time to be reviewing all that information and looking at that information and making quick decisions. So for me, as a large city, uh, we contracted with our uh, Indiana University Fairbanks School of Public Health. So we're very fortunate that that founding dean, uh, Paul Haverson, uh, was a former state health commissioner uh, and actually has a former director of public health practice at CDC. So, you know, some of these schools of public health, uh, they're not practical and don't always have a lot of what's happening in the realistic world. But with a a um, uh, person over their public health practice, Shandy Darf, we were able to contract with them to help do our contact tracing for our people who were positive. And then his team, uh, he had a number of faculty uh, teams um, uh, to help, but I also have one of the most incredible uh, directors of epidemiologists, Dr. Joe Gibson, uh, who's just uh, uh, just a genius, uh, to be quite frank. And so able to quickly put that data together and based on the data analytics, analyzing uh, it, telling us what we need to know. And then, so we're doing these partnerships. You know, I work with all of the superintendents of the schools. And there was a lot of things about the school systems I didn't know. And some of those recommendations I was trying to make, they say, you are crazy. That will never work. And you need to think about this. So I had to step back and look about making realistic uh, recommendations. So don't lose those contacts. Whether in, hey, your businesses can help you out too. And some of those businesses, they got some money. So um, keep those contacts with your not-for-profits. The faith-based community was incredible, no matter what racial and ethnic group was huge. Uh, a lot of the not-for-profit organizations that may be in the health arena, the health field. But listen, we talked to some foundations. There's resources out there who have never given a dime for health because it just wasn't even on their radar. But when we explain the rationale why this was critical and it's important for the health of our community. They gave us some money. They helped us out. Okay. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, that's just um, so comprehensive in, in terms of all of these questions that we have uh, asked. Uh, there was a show called uh, Dunninger, and I know I'm, I'm showing my age. Um, but that was one that 
uh, done as your head answers for every every problem was just absolutely on top of it. So you so, have attended. Randall, there's there's you've one more question. To Dunninger, and uh, so we'll get the question. Yeah, go right ahead. So it says, Dr. Kane, in terms of your budget now, and knowing what it took to respond to an unexpected pandemic, as well as now knowing where you were under resourced, how much more by percent do you think the overall Marion County Department would need to increase to be prepared for the next global uh, public health emergency? Uh, that's a that's a tough um, that's a tough thing. My budget increases every year overall by three percent. Okay, uh, and wow, if we had not had those additional federal dollars uh, from the community. And, and I can just say my overall budget is about $88 million. That's my overall budget. And I needed every penny of the $20 million uh, that was given to me for the COVID pandemic. Every penny and still some was not enough. And I'm going to really have to look at um, up in my salaries uh, for my folks in my health department. And I can't do everybody, but I really need to get them close to the market value, close to the market value. And I need to accomplish that in the uh, next three, three years, but understanding who you need to make them uh, comparable so you don't lose them who are your critical units, uh, you need to do that as quickly as, as possible. But um, we, we are understaffed. We don't have sufficient staff to do what we needed to do. And if we have a huge outbreak, uh, we had to have over 200 contact traces to, to just to try to help kind of keep, keep up. And when you have, I had to give recommendations to the, to the jails, the folks inside the jail. I, I had to give recommendations if there are outbreaks going on on a college setting. How do you handle that? How do you help them do testing? Because a lot of these places, they don't have ample staff to do all the testing. So when we had positives in the jail, I had to bring my additional staff in where I'm, if I'm having to screen over a couple of hundreds of employees, how do you make that um, happen. So it's tough for me to say how much money I need because, you know, this is being recorded. And so I may want to ask for more money from my board of trustees. And so I don't want to be locked in until we are really looking at that right now as part of my after action uh, uh, folks. So. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kane. And, and thanks to all who have contributed today in terms of uh, questions. Uh, Robin, we understand that uh, we're past time, um, but we want to make sure that uh, this is available for uh, everyone to uh, reference and uh, also to provide a, a summary uh, of this discussion today and compare a lot of the comments that were made today with those that have been shared by our various health departments uh, to this date. So on behalf of the Cobb Institute and, uh, and, beha and on behalf of uh, NACHO, uh, the National Medical Association, certainly Dr. Kane and I, we really appreciate your uh, attendance today and thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.